Thanks so much, guys. Uh, it's, it's, a real, it's a real privilege. Um, yeah, I'll just move it around. Thanks, Amelia. It's a real privilege to be with you guys, um, to be taking you for this session. Um, you know, it's, it's been a great conference. It really has. You know, I've, I've been enjoying these sessions, and I'm trying my best to apply what Adam was saying last night. I'm trying to be secure in grace because I'm feeling a little bit like Myrtle the turtle, you know? <laughs> I'm like jealous, man. These guys are titans. They're, they're, I'm just amazed at their gifting, and I'm so thankful, and I've been so profoundly ministered to. So I'm trying to be secure in grace, Adam, right? I'm trying to do it. And uh, you got to pray for me because I'm stuck between Adam friggin' Ramsey and Leon's friggin' crump on the other end. <laughs> and it's like, dude, come on, you know? Um, but to level the playing fields, man, I got the best topic, okay? There we go. The reformed leader, tasting grace. Ah, oh, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, was that you, man? Thank you. Look, it's a great topic. Um, but there's a lot to cover, right? There's a lot to think about. You've got the historical setting of the Reformation. How can you refer to the Reformed leader without referring to the historical setting of the Reformation period that gave rise to a certain kind of distinct leadership, a Reformed leadership? You've got to make reference to it. All right, and then out of that historical period, you've got this rich doctrinal heritage that gives us what we know to be distinctive of reformed leadership. We've got to talk about that. The problem is it takes forever to get through that stuff, and we haven't got forever. Uh, so my, in prep for this, I feel like my mission really has been to boil it down to its essence. What essentially makes a reformed leader? What makes the essence of a reformed leader? What is the Reformation essentially? Um, that's no small task either. But uh, I had some dudes helping me out. John, John Piper, my daddy, you know? <laughs> Your daddy, my daddy. Um, Piper wrote a, a really um, good historiography on Luther, and I think one way you must approach the subject is to, again, think about one of the original gangsters of the Reformation, Martin Luther, right? I mean, dude, this guy is the Reformed leader par excellence. Why? Because he led the church into Reformation, all right? And so to, I think if you can get what's happening in Luther's mind and heart, if you could understand just even a little bit the, the Copernican revolution taking place in Luther's mind and heart, leading him then to lead the church in Reformation, I think you make good ground in finding out what is essential to Reformed leadership. And again, Daddy Piper helped me out. He wrote his, his historiography on Luther. He said uh, uh, about Luther's theology, at the very heart of it, at the very heart of Luther's theology, was a total dependence upon God's free and omnipotent grace. Not, not the issue of um, purgatory or all the other surrounding issues. This was the central issue for Luther. The man is powerless to justify himself, of course, right? Powerless to sanctify himself and powerless even to trust God to do anything about it. That's bad news, man. In other words, for Luther, he needed grace. He needed good news. He needed the grace of the gospel. That's all that would help. And that is what then took central place in his heart and mind. That was the Copernican revolution that gave rise to his leadership and the leadership and seeking of, of reform in the church uh, during that period. And I think if that is what is uh, the heart of, of Luther in leading the church in the Reformation, it must be something essential to what makes up a reformed leader. Right, I think we have to think about that. I do want to drive that idea home, but I want to go to one greater than Luther. I want to go to one greater than Calvin. I want to 
want to go to one greater than any uh, of the reformers or any man that's ever lived, I want to go to Jesus. I think that's always good practice. Uh, go to Jesus and we'll go to Jesus through the Word. So turn it to John 21, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, it, it is a text that, that Dave uh, Fanny made reference to the other day, which was great. I really appreciated the way he set it up in that context. I love the way he referred to this in that context that he did. And um, I think he set us up well to think some more about this. Um, remember, we're asking the question, what makes a reformed leader? Luther has told us it's a doctrine of deep, desperate dependency. But it's more than a doctrine thing, right? It's, it's, it's a heart of hearts. And I know that this passage would have had a deep, resonant effect on Luther. It has had a deep, resonant effect on me. My, my prayer, and I, please join me, is that it would speak to you this morning. All right, let's pray. Uh, we've got to cry out to God if we've just said he does everything, we do nothing. All right, let's cry out. And I'm not playing religious games. Let's do that. Jesus, you have served us by your death. You have served us by your resurrection. Would you serve us now in and through your word? by the power of your spirit. For unless we are served by you, we have no part in you. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John 21, verse one. Let's go. After this, Jesus revealed himself. By the way, you need to turn to, I'm using the uh, elect standard version, but you can, you, you, you can use your reprobate version if you want to. The thing is, I don't trust that thing behind me, so you're going to have to turn to something to follow me. But I want to hug the text, so please turn there. Uh, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. So this is one of the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, as Dave said. One thing I'd like to say from the beginning is that this is not some random thing. When Jesus appears at these points, it's not random all right, they're very, very important, very calculated, all right, to not only give the apostles what they need by way of empirical evidence for their calling as eyewitnesses of the gospel and of the resurrection, but also that Jesus would in these moments minister to his own disciples by way of the fresh discovery of the cross and even resurrection at this point. The great archetypical minister of the gospel comes and ministers grace to these men showing his ongoing power and love for them in light of the cross, in light of the resurrection. You cannot miss that. You miss that, you miss the whole thing. All right, and we see that very clearly in the ensuing dialogue between Peter and Jesus, but even the lead up, man, it's connected and it's important, so stay with me. Verse two, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Interestingly, the men who were together when Jesus called them to what? Leadership, right? These are the men that were together when Jesus first called them to leave their nets, follow him, and they started getting groomed for leadership. And really what we have here is the three-year bookmark, the journey of their leadership now come to a close in terms of training anyway, and much time for them to reflect, of course. Jesus has told them, they've seen him already, he has already appeared to them in resurrected form, and he has told them to wait for, for him in Galilee. So that's what they're doing. Peter decides to go fishing. The others say, I'm going with you. One of the niggly issues that come up is, okay, well, what's happening? You know, are they, are they backsliding at this point? Is that what's, is that what's happening? Uh, and that's usually coupled with the idea that when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? He means these fish, these fishing nets, or, or these fishing boats, or the fishing industry. Now, I don't want to be offensive. I just, um, you know, if that's your view, just work with me a little bit. I, I really don't think that that was what was going on in the passage. Um, I love what Beasley Murray said, even though Jesus be resurrected from the dead, the disciples have to eat. All right, they, and they catch fish, it's what they do, that's how they get their food, they don't go to Walmart or wherever it is, uh, Countdown, you know, they, 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 they need to go get some fish, cut them, a, cut them some slack, right? So here they are, they're going fishing, and uh, you know, for whatever issue there might have been with fishing, the reality is, 
uh, although they're not backsliding, I mean, think about, think about this. They've seen Jesus only a few moments ago. They've seen him in resurrection form. I mean, how are you gonna backslide after that? Dude, you can't blame, I mean, you've just seen Jesus. He's back from the dead. You're not backsliding at that point. Uh, in only a few moments, they're gonna see Jesus again. Peter gets naked and dressed at the same time, falls into the water and somehow miraculously makes it to the shore. He's excited. He's excited. It's not the action of a backslidden man, all right? They're not backslidden. They love Jesus, man. They love him with all of their hearts, but they're in a kind of limbo because all that they had been trained for over the last three years, all their grooming for leadership had come to a grinding halt and all their confidence had been stripped from them. Why? Because they failed Jesus. They sinned. They failed him, man. Peter, three times denying Jesus. Can you imagine? So they are overjoyed seeing Jesus, but coupled with the joy is the coinciding grief of their failure. And at very least, they're wondering if Jesus still wants them as leaders. I mean, seriously, man, we messed it up so bad. Does Jesus even want us? Let's go fishing and we'll think about it. All right, but we got no confidence. We got no confidence. They had been shot to smithereens. Are there any leaders in the room? Have you ever felt like that before? Man, if that's you, hang in, hang in with me. I'll, I'm going somewhere with this. And uh, I trust it'll bless you. Maybe this is your one year lead into church planting, getting ready, getting psyched, and then one month after you plant the church. Tail between your legs, messed up so bad, you don't know what to do with yourself. Confidence stripped. Maybe this is after three years of seminary training, finally ready for that pastorate. First year, what a wipeout. Confidence stripped. Does Jesus even want me in this role? Maybe I overshot it. I don't know. Am I a leader? Maybe I'm not a leader. Maybe I need to think about other options. Well, I think that's super important to understand in this passage. That's the fundamental issue of context in this passage. All right, and you know why it's so important in light of this topic? It is what connects this passage to the essence of reformed leadership. And we'll see this in a second, but let's go. Verse three, the second part. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now that's a weird night. All right, they're experienced fishermen. They know these waters. To catch nothing is a weird night. It's a night to remember, all right? In fact, they got one more night like this to remember, one night like this that happened three years ago, the night before Jesus called them to what? Leadership, right? So this is truly the bookmarking uh, uh, occasion right here. And they're sitting in the boat catching nothing. They're saying, are you freaking kidding me? This is crazy. No fish. Ah, I remember a night like this. Ah, diddly-loo-loo, flashback, right? It's kind of like a lost episode. That's L-O-S-T, lost episode. I've just watched, by the way, all the lost seasons back to back. I'm feeling a little lost right now, to be honest. But man, you know what it's like? They're constantly flashbacking all over the place, and, and uh, it's, that's what's happening, right? They're in the boat. They're going, oh, I feel a flashback coming on. And, uh, and they're flashing right back to their beginning of leadership training, the beginning of seminary. All right, they catch nothing. Luke 5 tells us, this is three years ago. Luke 5 tells us that as day was breaking, Jesus says, guys, you catch anything? Ah, no, nothing. All right, well, throw your net on that side. Like, All right, and what happens? They bring in such a monster catch. They don't know what to do with themselves. They're freaking out. We see Peter freak out, of course. All right, but I mean, you know, here's the thing, right? I mean, we go, oh, they caught a lot of fish, that's nice. I mean, they're fishermen, dude. They're, they're, they're just like, the Lord of glory put fish into my net. And I can't even bring them all in. I mean, this is crazy. We don't even get that. So we see this have this crazy impact. In fact, they leave everything and they follow Jesus. And from that point on, they are fishers of men because of that moment. All right, it's huge. 
And it's the bookmark in their minds. So they're thinking about this, going, another night of, oh my goodness, I'm remembering that night. And then day breaking, we're back in the, current, back in the present, John, John 21, verse 4. Just as day was breaking, oh my goodness, look what happens. Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. It may have been early in the morning, couldn't see him. It may have been something supernatural, we don't know. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? Oh. They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net. Oh my goodness, can you imagine how they're freaking out at this point? <laughs> Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Oh. I mean, too nervous to speak at this point. It's like, what is, is that Jesus? Oh. You don't just obey random dudes who tell you to do what, what was something with your net. No, no. And yet, and yet, so they cast it. And now they were not able to hold it in because of the quantity of the fish, and what is the purpose of the miracle? It is to bring to mind the flooding recollection of all that had circulated through their mind and heart in the first call that had been issued to them after the very same Lord did the very same miracle. It caused Peter to think of what he did the first time, which was what, can you remember Luke 5? He ran to the beach, got on his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, depart from me. I am a sinner, O oh Lord. And by the way, that's a Reformed confession, amen? amen? And in Reformed theology, you're in a good place when you can confess that from, a heart, from the heart. That's a good thing when you know that. And in response to that confession of Peter's inadequacy, Jesus issues the call to ministry. Be not afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And they leave everything and they follow him. Now, all of that, guys, all of that is flowing through their mind on this boat right now. And it's no wonder that we see the, the, the reaction that we do, right? Verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, uh, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And then we see classic Peter. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea as you do. <laughs> Right? And I don't know how to explain that. I've looked at a million different commentaries. I think, other than to say there was clothing involved, there was water involved, it got wet, it got dry again. And he was just like, dude, I don't care. I'm ditching the luggage, fellas. My, my heart is on the beach. I want to get there. And he goes, these are not the actions of a backslidden man. He loves the Lord, man. All right? He doesn't care. He's jumping. Verse 8. The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire. Now just try and put yourself here. Hard night of toil, darkness, cold, no fish. Hungry. You need fish to eat the fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it. And bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Guys, can you imagine? It's like a little slice of heaven. The Lord who served them by his death. The Lord who served them by his resurrection. The Lord whom they had failed. Now stands before them as their servant. Serving them still giving them what they cannot provide for themselves. Verse 11, so Simon Peter went aboard, hold the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, the purpose of which is to show that this was a miracle. All right? And although there were so many, the net was not torn. All right? It's the same Lord who did the same miracle first calling them to leadership, showing them that as it was when they were first called, so it remains apart from me, you can do nothing. 
You cannot even catch one single fish. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. I mean, the gravity, right? Oh my goodness, this Lord that you've betrayed, that you failed, is serving you by his grace, providing for you. The glorious risen master is serving you in this moment by grace alone. Verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And with that stage set, we move into the interaction between Jesus and Peter. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now once again, guys, the these are not the fish. All right, it's the, obviously the men, right? Do you love me? It, Peter, is your love stronger than their love for me? Is your love better of a superior quality than their love for me? Do you love me more than they love me? Why would you ask a crazy question like that? Well, it's a very lucid answer. We know that there was, I mean, the, the three over denial of Christ by Peter was not an isolated random insta- uh, instance. It was the buildup of a confidence as a result of leadership training. When he started, he said, I am a sinner, depart from me, O Lord. That's a good place to be, but we see he slowly starts to think he's got this. A little bit of an edge every now and again. Oh, no, I got this one. Definitely got this one. I mean, he always gets shot down, so. But, you know, he's building up, he's building up. Toward the end, just before uh, the crucifixion itself, we know the story, right? Lord, I know you're saying someone's gonna betray you, but I want you to know it's not gonna be me. It's not gonna be me, Lord, I love you. In fact, I love you more than these. And if they betray you, fine, so what? I love you more than these, and by the way, that's why you should love me. So, he boasted the loudest, he failed at the most severe level, and Jesus singles him out with that in mind. And as Carson says, whatever potential there is for Peter to be restored to leadership depends on this moment of Jesus' restoration of him into that role amongst these men. That is the context for the these. That's what we have to understand But with that in mind then, what I want to do now is just read this text to you because I I want to allow its prophetic force to flow over you. It It is so powerful. Listen to me. This is, what I'm going to read now, year in, lies the essence of reformed leadership. Year in lies the essence of reformed leadership. It is so powerful for Peter and so powerful for every leader after Peter. So let's read it, verse 15. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, I'm sure that at some point or another, you have heard what's happening there in the Greek uh, with the with the uh, verbs for love. And if you hadn't, basically what's, what's going on is that when Jesus 
asks Peter, do you love me? He uses a very strong verb for love. When Peter responds to Jesus, he uses a weak verb for love. And even on the third time when Jesus uses the weak verb for love, Peter can never bring himself to do more than the same. And so immediately what we see is a very different Peter. He is weary to think of himself more highly than he ought. He is sober-minded, he's grounded, he's cut to the heart with his sin. He knows that he cannot put his confidence in himself as he once did. It let him down. But when Jesus asks him the third time, it's not that the verb change grieves him. It's the fact that he asks him the third time. Why? Why does it grieve him that he asks the third time? Because Jesus is here looking at the sin in direct view. Peter, you denied me three times. And he looks at the sin for the purposes of restoration. This is going to be the most important thing I say to you this morning. The way that Jesus restores Peter into leadership is not by works, but by grace alone. He restores him according to weakness, not strength. It grieves me that some have an understanding that is really the antithesis. Listen to me though, Jesus did not lead him now in works and the power of his own flesh. He did not say to Peter, Peter, all right, here's the deal. You denied me three times, this is very, very bad. I've got a plan. It's called penance. Give me three strong love verbs, three Hail Marys, bada bing, bada boom, you're back in the leadership business, baby. Thanks for coming. Let's keep moving. No, that's not what he did, right? It's not what he did. He leads him to, to draw out of him a confession of his own severe inadequacy, something that he might have forgotten, but something that he had already confessed. There's no legalism here. I love you, Lord, but it's a weak love. It's an imperfect love. It's a love that is not worthy of your love for me. It's a love that does not commend me or merit me unto leadership or your own love for me in leadership. My love for you is not equal for your love for me, to your love for me. And I know that my heart will only ever condemn me, but you are greater than my heart. So I leave it all with you, and you know what kind of love with this this is. I don't rest in that love. I rest in you. I rest in you. He had drawn from him a confession of his inadequacy and the total sufficiency of Christ. My heart condemns, but you are greater than my heart. And guess what? Jesus accepts his declaration because so far from disqualifying him from leadership, this has been the moment of central qualification. He cannot be an apostle that goes out to preach grace who has not tasted grace. He cannot preach that Christ is all sufficient without knowing this. This is what qualifies him for the role as a minister of grace. A reformed leader, we might say. Certainly, this is exactly what took place in Luther's mind and heart. A leader must be dependent upon Christ for everything, the central point of theology. Apart from Jesus, the apostles could do nothing. Apart from Jesus, the mission is null and void. Apart from Jesus, you don't catch one single fish. Church plotters, pay attention. Right? And apart from this realization, in fact, they would not be qualified as they ought. This is always the central point of qualification for those who preach grace. Now, guys, I want to I drill that home. I want, I, we've seen it for uh, Peter. We've seen it for Luther. But, of course, it's got to hit us, right? It's 
It's got to hit us in the deepest parts that it could possibly hit us if we would be leaders, if we would be reformed leaders. There's, um, there's much by way of discussion regarding the um, resurgence of Calvinism and the monsters that it creates when those who come from it can preach grace without tasting it when those who can argue the doctrines of grace without knowing what the heck they're talking about. And this must speak to that. Reformed theology and reformed leadership is more than a philosophical debate or a theological debate. Reformed leadership is coming to the end of your rope. Reformed leadership is coming to the end of yourself. All right, this is the essence of reformed leadership to come to the very end of your rope and then when you're on your knees, allow the all-sufficient, adequate grace, unmerited of Jesus to flow over you and give you everything that you need for the task that he has entrusted to you. All right, that is what reformed leadership is. That is the secret, as uh, was said the other day in Philippians. With Christ, I can do all things. But without Him, I can do nothing. Right? And if this hasn't sunk down, I don't care. You know, it just doesn't matter how big your church is or how good you are or whatever. You just, you're part of the problem of unqualified leadership. So let's listen. No matter where you are, let's listen. Each leader must be served by Jesus or they will have no part in him. And Jesus would serve us even through a text like this one this morning. So with that in mind, I want to end off just encouraging you. I, um, <clears throat> I know that at conferences like this one, it's, it's often the case that we have toiled throughout the year or last year or whatever it was, and we managed to get to the conference, which is pretty amazing on its own right because we're so low on steam. So we get to the conference, and everyone's all happy and vibey, and it's awesome, and ah. Uh, but you're dying, man. You're dying, and you know it's all good and well. We'll get through this conference, but you're tapping out at the end. Leadership is just, you, you can't do it. And man, I've been there so many times, been there at conferences, and oh, that I would have had a word like this one. I want you to consider something, if that's you. I want you to consider that much of your life might well have had a single purpose to, to it. That single purpose being to draw from your own heart and lips this morning a confession of your own inadequacy and Christ's sufficiency. It might have been that you've tried and that you've failed and that you've failed and that you've failed again and that you've sinned. And I know there's sins that disqualify and you need to look at those things. But let's assume for a second that that is not the case. Then I want you to consider what this text is saying, what Jesus would be saying to you, what Jesus is serving you in. What is he saying? He's saying, instead of letting your failure and inadequacy draw you away from my call to leadership, instead, let it bring you into alignment to the very essence of what makes a reformed leader, which is what? To strike you down at your knees, right? To leave you without anything of yourself and then to let grace flow over you, to let the all-sufficient Christ minister that grace to you as the archetypical minister of the gospel and then to let that grace refresh you and be the wind in your sail as you go on to the task entrusted to you. I want to pray with you now. All right, let's come. And you know, be careful if you think, oh, that's not me. I'm strong. I think it was Gary who quoted Paul Tripp. Dude, look at the evidence that the mountain of evidence around you that screams at you, you need Jesus. 
All right, so let's pray and ask that the Lord lead us according to the essence of Reformed theology as we are leaders, that we lead by grace alone. Lord, do you know where we are? And you are the great minister of the gospel. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. And we would ask that you take your own inspired word and apply it to the deepest, darkest place in our heart and preach the sermon within the sermon. And that you would leave no leader untouched by the taste of your grace this morning. And that that is what would fuel us. Your love for us, not our love for you. Your love compels us. Lord, make us reformed leaders, ministers of grace, those who have tasted it. In Jesus' name, amen.